this is a weird thing to say, but I, if I never had to play another gig, I would be totally, <laughs> totally happy. This is Joe Wong. Welcome to the Trap Set. I want to play something for you. Cliché by my guest, Jeff Parker. One of his generation's preeminent guitarists and musical minds, Parker has worked with a diverse collection of top-tier artists, including Brian Blade, Peter Erskine, Fred Anderson, Smog, Reese Chatham, and Joshua Redman. He's released several recordings as a band leader and is also well-known as a member of Tortoise. Long a presence on the Chicago music scene, Jeff recently relocated to Southern California. I spoke to him in downtown Los Angeles. And now my conversation with Jeff Parker. My father was a college professor. And my mom uh, was an elementary school teacher. Were you a good student? Uh, not really, man. Yeah, I always... I mean, I think as when I was a, a child, I was, when I got older. I, I've always struggled with school, like institutions and stuff. Authority? Structure? A, a, authority, structure, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, all of that stuff. What kind of music was on in the house when you were growing up? Um, I mean, we listened to the radio a lot. Uh, it's like, you know, 70s black radio, um, funk, um, R&B. Mm -hmm. uh, but my father also liked jazz a lot. Um, I also, you know, I, we went to church, so I was in church choirs, had that, um, that experience, music in the church. Uh, I felt like it was always music, you know. I mean, my parents listened to music all the time, I mean, especially my father. Did um, they play? No. No, my, uh, my father sang... I mean, he was kind of an amateur singer. Like he, uh, he, I think he always would have liked to be a musician. Um, but no, he didn't. They, they neither were professionals. I don't. There weren't really any professional musicians in my whole family, like extended family, even really. Um, there was one guy, uh, my father's cousin. Was a pianist up in uh, the Oranges in New Jersey named uh, Billy Hutchins. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, uh, I feel like I'm the only one. What did your dad teach? Uh, he taught like sociology. At, uh, he was teaching at the time at Hampton University, or well, it was Hampton Institute back in the mid 70s. Did you have brothers and sisters? I have an older sister. who's uh, She's an engineer, a civil engineer for, for, for the Navy. They got at least one person who was into school. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, just one. When did you start playing? I started playing um, my piano when I was uh, eight years old. Um, which I never really took to it uh, 
I mean, I still, I mean, I'm 52. I've been playing the piano since I was eight. I mean, I, st- <laughs> I still use it to write, mm-hmm. but it's always awkward. Um, but I picked up guitar when I was nine. Um, my sister had one that she, you know, she took lessons at one point and then kind of abandoned it, and I found it. And uh, was pretty drawn to, I mean, the guitar is an easy instrument to pick up and play, you know? You can just kind of, like, the logic, it's right there, you know? It's like a, it's kind of straight lines. You know, you fret it, and the the pitch goes higher, you know, on if you play on one string, and I could kind of, like, pluck out these, like, bass lines from funk tunes on the radio, you know, like Flashlight or, like, you know, uh, the tune by the band Slave Slide. Like, you could play all that stuff on one string, and I kind of, uh, my parents saw that I was into it, so they signed me up for lessons. And it's kind of, I've been playing ever since. Did you like lessons? I did sometimes. I mean, my first teacher was was amazing. I always wonder what ever happened to him. He's a guy named John Spencer. He was a uh, a student of my father's at the college. He was a music major. And, um, yeah, he was really great. I mean, he, um, he, he had me, like, writing my own music and improvising like right off the bat you know it's like my first probably my first lesson he kind of played some chords and kept the rhythm and he was like yeah just play what you and i kind of improvised and he used that to show me like position playing and um like a really cursory knowledge of of the neck mechanics of the instrument. But then I had some teachers after that who I didn't really like very much, like some group classes, just playing like folk song, folk chords. I didn't dig that too much. Yeah, how do you differentiate between a great teacher and a mediocre teacher? I mean, I can only say what works for me. You know, I've, um, I mean, like I, you kind of touched on earlier, I was always kind of had problems with uh, authority. So, <laughs> so I was always more drawn to teachers who were interested in what I wanted to get out of, of music. And when I teach, I try and, I mean, that's how I try and teach my students. You know, different people, some students need more structure um, I was never that type of student, you know. Um, I always wanted to learn, you know. Um, but for me, it's somebody who's kind of more interested in, who asks questions. Like, you know, you ask your students questions um, and let them kind of find, make their own way, you know. When did you start really connecting with music and feeling like it was less of a hobby and more part of your identity? Uh, pretty immediately. Yeah, I mean, uh, I was lucky to see some concerts when I was a young child, you know. Um, I mean, I always knew that I would have a life in music. I didn't necessarily... Uh, How did you know that? Uh, I mean, it was always just such a big part of, of, uh, of my, my world. I mean, I've, I've always listened to music kind of almost all the time. Did it seem like something that you could conceivably do, given the fact that you didn't have anyone in your family who was an example of how to do it? Uh... Yeah, I didn't, well, I mean, I always loved music. I mean, I listened to music constantly. I mean, I always um, always say so much of my, the path that I chose with music came from uh, me being drawn to 
to records. I mean, I've always loved, I love the format of the LP, you know, and I got into, I mean, I just used to listen to my father's records. I mean, I'd put on headphones, read the liner notes, look at the pictures and listen to the music, you know. It was, um, I never saw myself um, not doing that. And that's kind of, that led me into playing music. Um, which, you know, I mean, I, I know even if I had chosen a different profession that I would, I would play music, you know, I definitely would, uh, I'd play an instrument, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and I knew that at a, at a very young age, you know, I was, I remember my father went to this like jam session with some of his students, you know, he, he, he actually also played, uh, some percussion, like he had conga drums and stuff. He uh, he sounds like he was a pretty engaged teacher, you know. If he was hanging out with the students, yeah, yeah, he was. He was a great teacher, man. Um, yeah, and he was went to this jam session with his students. With he had his conga drums, and I was there, and like, I mean, I was like super and gay, like totally moved. I'd had to be like maybe six or seven years old. And it was then that I definitely knew that I wanted to play music. Um, yeah. Do you still get that feeling anytime you sit down to play? Um, I chase after it, for sure. Um, yeah, I still get it sometimes. I mean, not, not all the time. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's kind of, I've always looked for situations that keep, uh, that could keep me excited in that same way as when I was a kid mm -hmm. about music. I mean, that's why I kind of, uh, I keep trying different things because it uh, keeps me excited. When did you get into jazz? Immediately, like, um, I mean, from the moment I started listening to, to music, it was, um, I mean, it was always around the house. My father, you know, he had like a lot of old Blue Note records. He was attracted to the more, um, the funkier stuff, like, uh, like the organ stuff. Yeah. Like Jimmy Smith, um, Groove Holmes, uh, but he, you know, he liked, uh, Horace Silver, Art mm -hmm. Blakey, you mm -hmm. know. Um, it's kind of a remarkable label because I don't think they made a bad record. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd have to agree. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and they made a lot of records. Yeah. All of them sound great yeah. sonically. It's, it's kind of amazing. Yeah, it's an incredible label. You know, it's interesting because I feel like so you were born in, what, 67? Yes. Maybe by the time you were getting into your teenage years in the 80s, it seems like there was a shift in the world of jazz where it was becoming a bit more liturgical uh, mm. in some circles and um, became less... It became more kind of codified and it was being taught in institutions. Um so I wonder if you ever had a reaction against that as someone who's against authority, like against <laughs> the kind of like dogma that started to develop around it. For sure. Um, yes and no. Um, I mean, in a way, uh, I mean, it sounds like, you know, that was a uh, pretty intense time for the music um yeah to be wrapped up in it i mean it, it was funny because you know before i mean I, I went to berkeley um i went there too oh you did yeah oh man when uh in the late 90s oh, okay yeah i was there probably 10 years before you but um 
you know, I grew up in suburban Virginia, um, which wasn't uh, totally culturally devoid. Uh, I mean, there's a college radio station that played played some uh, jazz. Uh, the NPR station, you know, once the sun went down, they would play jazz all night. I'd listen to that. Um, and plus, you know, my father's record collection. But by and large, in popular culture, in the 80s, jazz was like like fusion. Fusion, uh, in the mainstream, it was very, like, fusion. Uh, yeah, it's when smooth jazz started to come in, too. Yeah. Yeah. Which is cool. But, uh, I mean, I had that perception of it. But then when I got to school, it kind of got very straight ahead, like, into... Um, into learning bebop, kind of reclaiming the tradition of it, which, uh, I mean, I think it's very important Mm -hmm. um, in a lot of ways to teach students fundamentals and have a kind of um, a healthy... uh, a healthy relationship between the traditions and, like, you know, to d- develop a foundation. I mean, I, I got very into that when I was in, in Berkeley. I mean, as like a lot of us uh, at the time, a lot of my classmates, we were really, like, wanted to learn how to play, like, um, straight ahead, you know, um, for me, it was more of a means, like, to develop a foundation. Mm-hmm. Um, not so much to to play that music as a career, but, I mean, I felt like if I had a, a good handle on, you know, playing bebop, playing changes, um, that it would give me a strong foundation to move in other musical directions. And I do feel... For me, that it was a very, is pretty, like, I'm glad that I did, that I went through that, you Mm -hmm. know. Um, I wouldn't say, I mean, and I say that, like, I don't think everybody should do that. Right. I'm glad that I did, you know. Did you graduate? No. No, I didn't. Neither um, did I. Oh yeah. <laughs> I don't think most people do. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. It's um they do now. Uh because the environment has really changed. Um I don't have a reg- regret. I mean, I didn't I deliberately didn't I mean, you know, much to the chagrin of my my parents. You know, they didn't want me to drop out. They wanted yeah, me to finish. Same. <laughs> and uh, I really felt like I let my parents down, actually. When oh, I quit. yeah. 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 I guess I kind of felt that way, too. But I don't. I mean, I specifically remember telling my mother, she's like, well, you have to have something to fall back on, you know. And I was kind of like, I know my personality, and I know that if I had had a yeah. degree and like, Oh man, I don't have any gigs. I'm the substitute teach. Mm-hmm. You know, I would just and like. And 20 years go by. <laughs> yeah, and I was yeah. kind of like, you know, I wanted to play, you know. Um, I wanted to be a musician. You know, I wanted to, I wanted to play. I wanted to learn how to play and just play music professionally. You know, that's what I wanted to do. And I knew that if I had followed, if I fell into something else, that that's what I would, where I would be, and I didn't want to have anything to fall back on. There were times when I regretted making the decision not to have anything to fall back. Sure, on. yeah. <laughs> I was like, "Fuck." Maybe I know. I yeah. Just go back to college. <laughs> I know. Same. <laughs> for, for sure. Anyway, you were saying you finished in Boston, and then what happened next? Well, I moved to Chicago. Um, 
I had a lot of friends who worked at the Tower Records in Boston. You know, the one on... Uh, the one on Mass Ave. Yep, Mass Ave. Which Ave isn't and there anymore. Yeah, 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 totally gone. But I had a lot of friends who worked in that department, um, or in the jazz department. And um, Tower was opening a new store in Chicago. Um, I knew that I didn't want to move to New York um, at the time. Uh I thought that eventually I would move to New York, but at the time, in 1990, I I don't know, I felt like <clears throat> it was too expensive. You know, I had some student loans and stuff, and uh, I they were opening Tower Records in Chicago. They offered me a job at the, the Tower. I didn't want to move to New York, so I moved to Chicago um, to work at Tower Records. Um, and I just, my plan was to save some money and practice and like work in the record store, pay off some of my student debt. And then once I felt I had some confidence, I was gonna move to New York did you not have confidence at the time? Uh, no. <laughs> I didn't. I mean, I mean, music I, school will do that to you. It will, yeah. I mean, it, I, I did have confidence, but I wanted, I don't know, man. I felt like, and this is super respectful to like all my New York musician friends, but I felt like, I saw a lot of musicians move to New York and kind of like lose their their um, individual, like their direction and path and stuff. You know, they'd be in Boston kind of like trying to figure out their own thing and then they'd move to New York and I'd hear them and come back and, and they would kind of sound like everybody else. Mm-hmm. And I was like, man, I don't want to do that. Like. So I I moved to Chicago, you know. Do you feel um, like you had your own thing by the time you moved to Chicago? Uh, I had ideas for mm-hmm. sure about I I knew what things I didn't want to do. Like what? Uh I didn't want to play straight ahead, you know, like yeah, I didn't want to To contextualize th- that that was there was like a resurgence in straight ahead at the time it was like this young lions movement yeah i mean i yeah. didn't i knew that that was something that i i wasn't very interested in doing um you know i was in the more like in the experimenting i was in the like improvising you know I liked a lot of different kinds of music. You know, I liked reggae and I liked hip hop. And uh, I don't know, I used to, I was thinking about all of that stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, it was a, a, in retrospect, it was a very good decision for me to move to Chicago when I did because uh, the city, it, it was pretty wide open. I mean, it for me, you know, I met a lot of musicians. Um, the musicians from the AACM who kind of like opened things up for me in a very uh, profound way. For people that don't know, what is the AACM? Uh, it's uh, the Association for the Advancement of Creative Musicians. Um, it's a musicians collective. Uh, Art Ensemble of Chicago, Anthony Braxton, George Lewis, um, yeah, Nicole Mitchell, like a lot of great, great musicians, young. Um, and 
old. Um, yeah, I'm, those were some of the first musicians I met. When I moved there, I started playing with them. And from there, I met uh, the, mu the musicians in Tortoise. You know, they were fans of Johnny Herndon, particularly. Heard me play with some groups from the AACM. And uh, that's how I connected with him and then in the Tortoise. So. beginning um i didn't want to like disrupt things too much because they had such a like beautiful thing i mean i saw him the first time i saw tortoise was at the empty bottle and you know the instrumentation it was it was six of them at the time it was uh two bass guitars two drummers um, Dan Bidney kind of floating around playing hand percussion and like various um, things um, and Brad Wood was playing saxophone and it was uh, I had never heard anything like it it was kind of like minimal and like weird like rhythm heavy like low end and when they invited me i mean they first just invited me to sit in with them like brad stopped playing with them um for whatever reason i don't know if he it was maybe right around the time he moved out here um i don't know if you do you know brad Wood? Mm -hmm. i don't know him that well but yeah. i've met him before okay yeah he um you know uh record producer, multi-instrumentalist. Um, but they just asked me to sit in with them. Um, and my main thing was I didn't want to, like, step on that stuff with, like, guitar. Guitar, basically. <laughs> so I kind of... Uh, Just tried to play in a way, just like leave a lot of space, like not play a lot of chords, um, and just kind of like fit in kind of as this more, in a more textural way, so as not to disrupt what I perceived as the sound that they had created. Yeah. And then when did you feel <laughs> like you were part of the band and uh, part of the sound? Well, I went on tour with them. Um, I did a tour of festivals with them in the summer of 1996. Uh, I wasn't technically in the band, but... Uh, Yeah, I don't. I, I mean, and after that tour, they asked me to be in the band. You know, um, it was pretty loose, like a pretty, uh, for lack of a better word, organic way that I kind of entered into that that fold. Um, Yeah, and then we started working on music together. Like they, uh, I played on some sessions for Millions, um, that ended up on like 
weird singles compilations and stuff, but I um, wasn't on what came to be the album because that was before I was in the band. Um, but for TNT, you know, we started like, I mean, we were all living together. Like we had a loft, maybe twice as big as this. And same. That's a big like, loft. We're in a, yeah. I well, mean, yeah, well, there were like yeah. six, five people living there, you know. We yeah. all had like, had built walls and like made our own bedrooms. And John had built, John McIntyre built a studio in the loft, you know, much like, it's a lot smaller than that, um, than your studio. Maybe 60%. Like we could all barely fit in there, you know. So for those of you that are listening, my studio is about 220 square feet. So right. his would, <laughs> would have been like 170 or something. Yeah. yeah. The much lower ceiling. Um, what was the rent? Man, I think the whole place was 13, 1350 is what. Uh, yeah. So everybody's paying like two fifty or something. Yeah, well, some. I mean, it depended on how big your room was. Oh, uh, okay. If you had a small room, you paid less. Like I think uh, John McIntyre had biggest room and had the studio, so he paid more. Um, yeah, it was, but it wasn't nothing, man. I mean, I was like. Less than three hundred dollars. And what was your life like at the time? Aside from tortoise, were you playing, you know, every night of the week with other musicians and working lots of gigs? Yeah. And you weren't working at Tower Records anymore? No, no. I only worked at Tower for uh about a year and a half. Um Was that the last day job you had? That is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, it is. I mean I'm knock on wood. Do you have a big <laughs> record collection? I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have, uh, I don't know, maybe, not giant. I mean, it's pretty, I mean, it's big. I have probably 5,000 records. But, I mean, I know people who have. Of course. <laughs> 50,000 or yeah. whatever, yeah. But anyway, so you were working all the time. I was working, yeah, I was making my living as a jazz musician um, around Chicago. I mean, playing, I was playing with a lot of organ groups. I was playing with Charles Erland's band for a moment. Um, I don't know if you know him. He's a great organ player from Philadelphia who settled in Chicago. Um, had some hits like uh, in the early 70s. Um, he did a cover of More Today Than Yesterday. That's like a big, I mean, that's still. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. So I was playing with his band, this great organ player in Chicago named Chris Foreman, a drummer named Greg Rockingham. He and Greg uh, had a group. I was a guitar player in there. Um, I got that gig from Bobby Broom. When he got busier playing with Sonny Rollins, like he kind of passed that gig on to me. I played with them. Um, I was playing with some groups from the AACM, a group called the New Horizons Ensemble. And then, you know, like weddings and like coffee shops and like just shit like that that musicians do. Like, Yeah. Did you feel like you were living the dream or were you aspiring to something even greater or both uh, living the dream no man i mean it was hard i mean i was it was very it's a very bohemian kind of lifestyle you know a bunch of like kids in our 20s like crammed into this loft in <laughs> yeah. chicago um you know no money. I mean, we were super broke. Um, kind of just taking stuff day to day. I mean, I was glad to be doing what I was doing. I've never been very ambitious with music, you know. I've always... Um, you mean ambitious in a business way? 
Yeah, in terms of career and like goals and stuff like that. It's um it's just not me. I'm just uh I'm just happy to be making music, you know. I mean it's then and now. You say that you're not ambitious and you don't set goals, but you also seem to know yourself and know how to trust your instincts. On the right. other hand, like yeah. for example, you didn't just go to New York like lots of your peers from Berkeley. You right. went to Chicago so you could develop your own thing. Right. I don't even really look at it like that. I mean, I kind of, you know, they offered me a job in Chicago and I took it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, and that's kind of how I ended up there. If they had offered me a job in New York, I might have ended up there. I mean, I don't know. Not like... um I mean, I guess I'm kind of contradicting myself, but I don't know. I mean, I guess I kind of feel like, you know, life puts you on these paths and you can either follow them or, or not, you know, mm -hmm. it was, um, yeah, I don't know. It's like, I don't I never know why I end up where I am. So. I saw you play at the Blue Whale, maybe it was about two years ago when your album, The New Breed, came out. Oh, yeah. And your daughter was singing with you. Yeah. When was she born? Uh, she was born in 2002. So what was your situation at the time where you, you weren't still living in the loft, were you? No, no, no. There had been a lot. Um, there was a lot in between that. Um, okay, what happened? Well, um, Tortoise got busy. Um, I joined, had Isotope 217, Tortoise. Like, I kind of had these two bands that I was writing music for. Um, you know, but I, I also, you know, I was in Brian Blade, like, in, in the, the very first version of the Fellowship Band, I met Brian when I did an audition for Joshua Redman's band when he was kind of looking for a guitar player, um, probably in 1995. And we kind of hit it off. I mean, we had fun um, for whatever reason. I don't know why at that time. Maybe because I was living in Chicago, like... Uh, I didn't end up playing with Joshua's band until later. But I met Brian, and Brian said, man, if I ever start my own band, I'm going to call you up. So played with, with Brian's band, made the first Fellowship album. And all this was, like, congruent with Tortoise and Isotope kind of doing things. Um, I remember Brian called me up and said, um, Man, Joni Mit Joni wants us to be her band, man. Like he, Joni Mitchell wanted the Fellowship Band to to back her up and go on tour and stuff. And I couldn't do it because TNT had just come out, and we had a whole year of touring booked, you know. So that was kind of a. Uh, was it a difficult decision or? Were you more invested in Tortoise? Oh, I mean, point? I was yeah. kind of... Tortoise had already become like a, an entity. Um, it wasn't the type of band, like, if I couldn't make the tour, the tour would have, would have been canceled. Yeah, it was like, like a it family. Not, yeah, we yeah. were like a band. I mean, yeah. it was... Not a group. A group versus a band or a band versus a group. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there were no interchangeable parts. Um, and I remember actually even telling the guys in Tortoise, man, Blade called me. He wants us to go on tour with Joni Mitchell. And those guys were like, oh, man, that's great. You should do it. And I said, uh, well, what are we going to do? And they're like, we just have to cancel the tour. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, man, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. So, but any, you know, Tortoise toured and like, we made some money and yeah that was a big and, record yeah 
when he moved out of the loft. I mean, and everybody kind of like the future, you know, we became adults. Mm -hmm. You know, we bought bought property. People started businesses. Um, Did you start a business? No, but John, you know, he built a studio. And uh, yeah, this things became different. Um, and, uh, I mean, I had had a different, my partner at the time, you know, we moved in and started a family and that's when my daughter was born, Ruby. Do you have more children than her? I have a son who's, uh, named Ezra. He's almost eight. Oh, cool. Yeah. Ruby still lives with her mother in Chicago. And Ezra lives out here with me and my current partner. Mm-hmm. Um, so kind of jumping forward, but what was the impetus to move out here? Uh, I mean, it was kind of, uh, I don't know if, I mean, I love Chicago. Um, I feel like I was a, little uh, kind of stagnant artistically um i felt like i was um you'd been there for over 20 years at that point yeah Yeah. um and my partner uh the filmmaker leanne schmidt she teaches at cal arts um and uh you know, our son Ezra was born, and we were kind of living in both places for a, c- a couple years, which was why I say I kind of transitioned out to L.A. for um, about three years. Um, but, you know, he got older and started school, and I had to make a decision. Um, either they were going to move to Chicago or I had to move here. But I felt, you know, I felt like I needed some fresh, fresh ideas. Um, So I came out here, you know. I'm still in Chicago all the time because Ruby still lives there and I still have a lot of close musical associations in that community. But, yeah, I just wanted to try something different. And how do you feel about it now? Did it work? Did it give you new ideas? Yeah, yeah, I, I absolutely did. Um, and a fresh perspective. Uh, I like it out here. It's um, it's a strange place, you know. Um, just with the. I always tell people it's 180 degrees from Chicago because it's, uh, Chicago is very like, um, it's kind of the creative music hub of the whole world, if you ask me. It's like the community there is really vibrant, you know. It's um, with free improvisation and weird music and the AACM, like it's, and all of that stuff is ingrained into the mainstream arts community, you know. Um, Why do you think that is? I don't know. Like, I mean, I'd, I always kind of uh, analyzed it in my own way. You know, it's in the Midwest. Mm-hmm. If you go at the east, west, south, it's like cornfields, like nothing. You know, mm-hmm. if you go west... You'll hit Minneapolis in eight hours, but in between that, it's like essentially. I mean, it's just. I grew up in Milwaukee, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, well, no. I mean, you'll hit Milwaukee uh, respectfully. I don't mean that. <laughs> <laughs> and then Madison, and yeah. then but it's a lot of like it's a big city, kind of in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and before, like it was a lot of independent independent music there kind of by default Mm -hmm. you know like record row with all the like black recording studios and uh distributors um 
touch and go records like sure. punk rock uh what's the uh wax tracks mm-hmm. for the how like there's all this independent music in chicago mm-hmm. because um it before had to that be chess you know yeah yeah and, and then there's everything from you know sun Ra and yeah. um art ensemble yeah uh, Del- you know Mark, i've never yeah. thought of it that way like what you said uh the creative music capital so then la would be the commercial music capital yes <laughs> so it's the exact opposite you know um like just as i mean amazing musicians here but uh you know every everything's the exact opposite it's kind of like what's you know very mainstream entertainment uh industry Mm -hmm. which is strange have you been doing uh gigs like that have you been playing on like major label records or um, no you know big tv or film scores or anything no no i haven't (laughs) well i've seen you play in la several times and it's always kind of more of a creative music improv music environment yeah that's kind of uh I mean, that's when I was saying earlier, I feel like, I mean, that's where people, that's where they put me, mm-hmm. you know. Is that where you want to be? Uh, sometimes. <laughs> sometimes I wish people would expect that I could do other things because I know I can do other things, you mm-hmm. know. Um I mean, I haven't quite uh, shed my bohemian lifestyle. I mean, now, I mean, I've, I mean, it's hard to pay bills sometimes still, even now, you know, I mean, I'm a, I have an established career, but I mean, I would like to have that kind of work, but I don't really know how to get it. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'd like to be creative music person. I mean, I think it's where I thrive, actually. say that it's 180 degrees difference from Chicago so how has that actually affected your outlook as someone who's kind of still playing in similar circles uh how has it affected how has it changed the way like changed your relationship to music oh um well i mean i think i can only think about an album like the new breed i mean i had those ideas when i lived in chicago and i could have made that record with musicians in chicago and it w- but it would have sounded completely different you know um everything about it would have been different um And I think uh, I don't know. I've kind of become become a part of uh, whatever community, wherever you end up. You mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. I can't. Um, I definitely know the music that I write out here. Uh, is a lot different than the music that I was writing in Chicago because, I mean, I write music for the musicians that I play with. Um, And if I'm playing with cats out here who are like, 
in the entertainment industry, they interpret interpret the things in a different way. You know, it's uh, definitely not any worse or better, but different. Mm -hmm. um, and I can't help but be affected by that. Mm -hmm. um, and plus, I mean, I have a teenage daughter, so like. I listen to a lot of pop music. <laughs> what does she like to listen to? Uh, Ruby, she likes uh, Lauren Hill. She likes a lot of like... Which is kind of old school for yeah, her. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like other kids her age aren't li necessarily listening to that. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. But she likes, you know, R&B stuff that's on the radio or... Uh, yeah, radio, pop. Um, what does Ezra listen to? Ezra. Uh, Ezra listens to pop. He's, um, he requests, um, when we were in the car yesterday, he wanted to hear, like, all the songs from Into the Spider-Verse. <laughs> oh okay <laughs> sunflower you know that song yeah sunflower <laughs> <laughs> did having children affect your relationship with art your art your oh music? yeah how yeah. so for sure well it wasn't about me uh anymore i mean i actually i mean i've said this before like i wouldn't even have a career as a solo like, as Jeff Parker, I mean, all I wanted to do is just, like, play in bands with my friends, you know. Then I had a kid, and now it's kind of like, oh, man, I need more options. So I uh, started to put myself out there more, you know. Did that give you any kind of anxiety to put yourself out there? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't like, I don't like, uh, I don't like performing, you know. I and I can <laughs> this is a weird thing to say but I if I never had to play another gig I would be totally <laughs> totally happy in front of an audience mm -hmm. like I don't I like to play music and I like to play music with musicians I don't like to like see photos of myself playing or like see myself on stage uh i mean for the first 50 or more episodes of this show i could i couldn't even listen to my own voice without yeah cringing. i'm sure <laughs> and I'd, i you know i've been playing music for a long time but most of that time it was as a drummer and i felt like there was an apparatus protecting me right yeah <laughs> or insulating me to a certain extent yeah but I also now that I've been making music for my, you know, under my own name, uh, I'm about to put out a record. Oh, great! It feels more rewarding too, in a way, and mm -hmm. it, and being letting myself be more vulnerable feels more scary in a way that's getting me back to that feeling of joy that we were talking about earlier. Sure. Um, I feel like I was kind of stagnating, doing what I was doing for a while, and I think taking more of an emotional risk has been healthy for me. I wonder if it feels that way for you too. Did it feel like you were moving forward in a way? Yeah. Yeah, it did. Uh, I don't know if it forward. I would definitely, uh, sideways. Maybe. <laughs> it felt like you were moving anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Expanding. Mm -hmm. I would say, mm -hmm. um, and now, on a, now I prefer to make my own. It's harder for me to collaborate with other musicians now. Um, I've kind of turned into uh, a... <laughs> I have a... Uh, there's... I used to play with this organ player in Chicago. Uh, this blues, really great blues organ player named Tony Z. Tony Zamani. And uh, he had... <laughs> He had this thing that he called band leader syndrome, mm -hmm. whereas like when a sideman doesn't want to be a sideman anymore, 
He said, he got band leader syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> so you got band leader syndrome. I kind of have band leader syndrome now. Yeah, it's not a... I find myself grumbling about... I mean, I probably shouldn't put it out there like publicly like this because people will stop <laughs> calling me for gigs. <laughs> but, well, I know what you're talking about, though, because once I started making my own music, it felt more difficult for me to take instruction for people as a composer. Right. You know, because as a composer, you're facilitating someone else's vision. That's basically what it's all about. Mm. Is you're trying to see the world through their eyes and and try to see the emotional needs of whatever they're making and trying to facilitate that. Right. And, well, I'll say it this way. It made it, it made me less patient with people whose creative vision I didn't feel like I was in alignment with. And so all of a sudden I became more picky about who I was collaborating with. Sure. Which was scary to me. <laughs> yeah. Also, to turn away work. Sure. Yeah, in a while, after a while, it becomes an act of self-preservation, you know. Well, Jay Bellrose, the drummer from uh, your group that I've seen at ETA several times, mm -hmm. had some really wise words to say about that. I mean, he seems very adept at saying no, which has, is not something that comes easy to me. You know, I, I had to work at it. Yeah. You said that you're not the kind of person that makes goals but is there anything that you want to try creatively that you haven't done yet? Yeah, I mean, I I wish I could work with singers more. I mean, that's why I make music with my daughter, you know? I mean, she sings and... She's a great singer. Oh, yeah, she is. She's awesome. She works really hard at it. Um, yeah, I'd like to work more with singers. Um, I mean, I... That's something that I would like to do. Uh, aside from that, um, compose for a bigger ensemble of uh, horn strings. I mean, those are two pretty big things mm -hmm. for me right now. How do you feel right now? Uh, a little bit anxious. I've been work. I'm in. I'm at the end of making a new album. Uh, myself and Paul Bryan have been mixing for the last couple weeks. And I'm kind of, uh, everything's under a microscope. And I'm mm -hmm. very, like, uh, <clears throat> really critical, self-doubting all of the work, you know. I was listening to it last night, and it's like, this sucks, man. I don't want to put this out. I want to redo everything. Isn't that how you feel every time, though? It is. I think so. So once you know that it's a pattern, then maybe you can kind of have that perspective, like, all right, this is a normal part of the process. Yeah, but I always forget, man. Yeah. And once you're in it, it feels brand new. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I lived with the new breed um, which is an album I'm super proud of for two years, you know. I mean, and when it was done, I don't remember it. if I... I don't remember feeling like this when I was making that album. I'm sure I did. Um, but it sucks, no? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm going through a similar thing. I'm mixing a record right now, too. Yeah. And uh, I'm like, I want to redo all the vocals. Right. I can't sing. Yeah. <laughs> so what would your advice be to somebody like me? Man, probably not very good advice <laughs> at this point. I mean, it's, it's always good to make the work. Um, the thing I've always tried to do is make honest work, you know, like not be a f like not if you like it don't really be concerned with how what other people think you know 
Yeah, just make the work and be honest, you know. Well, that's what you got to do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying right, to turn yeah. it back around on you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I can't wait to hear it. Jeff Parker, thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, man, it's my, my real, real honor. Trap Set is produced by me, Joe Wong, along with Chris Karwowski, who also edits the program. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at The Trap Set. And visit our website, thetrapset.net, to subscribe to our show for free. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please donate to our show. If you can't afford to donate, please tell a friend and give us a good rating on iTunes. Send your feedback and guest requests to thetrapset at gmail.com. Oh.